Hi everyone and welcome to today's Google News session. Uh, today we're going to be looking at reporting on a really, really large sports event, the kind that's so big that we actually can't mention what its name is, but either way it's coming up pretty soon. And we're going to talk today about how to use a few different tools, including things like Pinpoint, Search, uh, some Flourish, and even Google Earth to uh, get you started on reporting on a big event. My name is Miguel D'Souza uh, and I'm just going to begin with a very important thing, which is that I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Miguel de Souza. I'm a journalist and teacher trainer. Uh, I'm the Google News Teaching Fellow for Australia, and I've worked on the internet putting out news since 1994 for companies like AAP, news.com.au, Seven, and SBS. Um, I've put my details on the screen. I'll also put my Twitter handle there in case you want to tweet me. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, let's get started. Today we're going to look at tools to help you cover a long sports event whether it's a single sports discipline like the World Cup or multi-sports events like the Commonwealth Games or Asian Games. I'm going to show you a few new tools from Flourish, an application from Google Earth's projects tool, and a workflow involving search operators and Pinpoint that allows you to set up your very own database for live sports reporting. So let's get started. Uh, before we do, though, I just want to tell you a few things about the Google News Initiative. Now, the GNI is Google's effort to uh, build a stronger future for journalism through uh, training sessions like this one uh, and helping publishers develop sustainable business models and help new organizations adopt new tech. A very good example of this is the Journalist Studio. I really recommend you do spend a bit of time on it. Um, with today, we're going to focus on tools like Flourish and Pinpoint which are also part of the Journalist Studio. But tools like Project Shield can also be invaluable protection for uh, individual reporters working with sensitive material, um, while other tools like Fact Check Explorer and Trends, which we will look at today, offer really useful story resources. Now, let me take a closer look at the Fact Check Explorer and how it can help you get some useful background around a big sports event. You'll find that linked off Journalist Studio, and I've got the URL there just for you. So false news is spread around all major events. Google's Fact Check Explorer has been helping journalists track stories around large sports events. Um, an international network of fact checking agencies, including AAP and AFP here in Australia, have been reporting on hoaxes and falsehoods often which piggyback on big events. Now, these may not only be big sports events, they can be all sorts of events, but because athletes are high profile celebrities um, for a few weeks at a time, and they have political views as well, it's very likely that uh, sometimes you might find falsehoods sort of stirring up around uh, these people. You'll also find stories about performance enhancing drugs, uh, things like, uh, for instance, uh, even and a, and a fake fireworks display at Mount Fuji, which was actually a subject of uh, a, a debunking by AAP and AFP. So, uh, another really cool uh, Google search engine, which is not terribly well known, is actually Google's patent search. Um, here's a little known Google search focusing on the thousands of patents that are filed each year. Um, now, this is an example. This is a patent filed by Nike for a type of bonded carbon fiber plate, which is actually in prototype marathon shoes, which uh, have been the subject of uh, some controversy in news. And again, you can keep up to date with uh, patents around sports equipment that are filed by uh, some of the major sports manufacturers all the time on things like the Google patent search engine. And again, these are, uh, it, you can actually dredge up quite a few interesting stories there. Uh, just a reminder as well, if uh, you are interested in pursuing a little bit more knowledge, uh, you can sign up to training courses on g.co slash news training. The important thing there is, is you get to learn at your own pace. Uh, it's a really good place to pick up uh, new digital skills, uh, learn how to program, use Google's geo and satellite tools. Uh, you can also learn how to scrape and manipulate data. They're all fantastic story generation tools, and they can also deliver unexpected angles 
to stories that your audience really cares about or give you a completely new way to tell your stories. This year, we want to help journalists tell these stories using data and insights uh, to help people see sports events as never before. Uh, it's very likely for a lot of Australian audiences that with uh, all of the, uh, the time that we've spent indoors locked in due to COVID, uh, there's going to be a really high demand for uh, content right across uh, the web uh, and also for mobile. It doesn't necessarily need to be sort of uh, live coverage. It can actually be the stories around it, which can be just as compelling or sometimes more compelling than the events themselves. So let's start with a crucial tool which can help with story generation around an event. I'll just pop the URL in the, the window there for you. That is for the Google Trends website. Let me just grab that and pop that. So in most large sports events, new stars emerge and interest surges from well outside the communities of established fans or for a sport or players. And remember when you pop in that URL, make sure to edit the geo links so that the link goes to your local training tab or indeed just to use the filter to make sure that you've got for Australia. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, just think about something about athletics. Most people don't think about it for about uh, four years or so. And then just as a big sprint event looms, interest surges. Just look at this graph of search uh, interest in 100 metres. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? But what about the related topics? People were searching for detail about the event, who was competing perhaps, and as evidenced by how general some of the queries are, maybe even a quick explainer about the event. Just remember this important point about trends. Um, you, it does uh, give you a bit of a cue that perhaps, um, you know, user interest is surging and around an event. Search terms, um, so this is a very important point about trends. Um, search terms show interest for uh, an exact word or phrase in a given topic. Language, I'm sorry, while topics are language agnostic and capture clusters of search terms, as I just explained, but also account for acronyms and misspellings. So uh, just so that to reinforce that, I'm just going to pop that up on your screen. Just remember that search terms do that. They will give you interest for that exact term that you're searching for. But you might want to instead use something like a topic because they're language agnostic and they capture things like clusters of search terms. And they're more reliable than search terms when you're using trends. Keep those in mind. They're all really important. But look, I'm going to show you a, a few examples that might help you understand it a bit better. The daily and trending search data can be a great source of inspiration as to what to pitch or cover in any upcoming piece. Let's look at how Ash Barty's fantastic Wimbledon win played out on trends. Now, I'm just going to jump to a live window here. Now, as you can see, interest in Ash Barty has always been pretty high right across a 12 month sort of period, specifically when obviously in Australia, the tennis season starts to happen and peaking just recently with Wimbledon, pretty obviously. But let's have a look down and let's see what else we can find out. Well, in this case, you've got a 12 month view which has rising interest. So you can see right across there, Wimbledon, the Australian Open and various opponents that she's had and also matches that she's played in. But let's have a look at the top related topics. Now, these are queries that over a 12 month period of time um, are topics that are definitely related to the subject of Ashley Barty. These are the sorts of other topics that people are interested in if they're interested in her. So you can see here again, Wimbledon, uh, the tennis, tennis as, as such as a whole, uh, opponents that she's had and uh, various tournaments that she's played in. Now, over here, these related queries are kind of interesting too because these rising ones will tell you what the top queries are in the last, say, 24 hours. Now, if we filter for top, you can see, again, probably some just checks on, you know, exactly how to spell her name, that sort of thing. Kind of interesting. But let's have a look at a seven-day view. 
Now, this is interesting because this is much more recent. Obviously, she's won the Wimbledon tournament. But again, you can see a lot of interest in her opponents. But this is interesting. Um, Ash Barty has always worn her, uh, has worn her uh, Indigenous Australian identity very proudly. Uh, and she often talks about her heritage. And this is kind of interesting to see that this has meant that users are starting to be curious about it. So sometimes it's worth um, considering that this might help you in terms of planning your content. It's worth mentioning her Indigenous heritage. It's worth exploring it, perhaps explaining it, her, her background, her identity, many statements she's made. She's always had said really interesting things about it. Uh, let's just continue. You can see again uh, a popular um, other topic is Yvonne Goulagon Corley, another popular Australian tennis player, um, and so on. Um, and you can see again uh, starting to get even into personal issues. But you can see there, uh, and if we filter for rising in this case, we're now starting to get to uh, uh, you know more contemporary topics, which is kind of interesting that people were actually searching off for that. But you can see that again if we can also try and filter for the next hour. And while interest is still relatively high, as you can see, it's tailing off as we head to the Olympics. But again, if we start to filter for top tournaments, again, identity, Wimbledon, it keeps coming up. It's really important. And I would imagine if we started to have a look, there you go, you'll find that the Olympic Games turn up. So it's a useful tool, Trends, um, for story generation. Uh, there are always uh, other ways that you can use it, certainly. Uh, you know, one interesting thing uh, going way back on day four of the games uh, in Rio in 2016, there was a surge of interest in people wanting to take up equestrian sports, just as the horses took to the ring in the games. Look, that sort of thing is, is kind of really interesting because, again, um, you know, some of these sports uh, can really break out of their categories of sports and uh, certainly with things like horses, you see there's always a lot of interest in horse riding and equestrian sports in general. Um, one more over here, uh, it's just keep this one in mind, the page will be launching really soon, but uh, there will be uh, a Google Olympics Trends page and uh, that will give you breakouts into every individual sport and how they're trending. Uh, so keep an eye on it. Uh, keep an eye out for it. Just visit the Google Trends page and uh, it should be up there uh, very, very soon. So now let's uh, have a look at some applications for Google Earth, which can be a fantastic for covering uh, an event like a cycling stage race or something big like a marathon. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you a couple of little projects. Uh, and of course, I'll just pop the Google Earth URL onto the screen for you so you can use it if you need to. Um, I'm just going to jump to something that I've created using Google Earth's project tool. Now, uh, when you visit Google Earth, you'll see here that there is a projects tab down here. Now, if I click on that, you can see I've got quite a few projects that I've created, but there's one in particular that I wanna just show you right now, which is uh, one that I've created around the Mont Ventoux stage of the Tour de France. Uh, now, and this is a good way for me to show you how the project tool works. So once you've created your project, it's pretty simple to add places to it. So say for instance, if I want to add a stage to the tour, uh, like for instance, if I wanted to, uh, uh, let's see, add one of the calls. Let me just quickly grab one. So for instance, if I uh, wanted to Let's see, grab the Col de la Guerre, de la Guerre. I'll just quickly grab some coordinates for that off screen. So what I'm gonna do now is search for it. So if you watch my screen here, I'm just gonna quickly search for some coordinates. I'll just zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. Just pop those in there and hit enter. Now, 
Dale Turner. And let's go back to normal size. So now you can see that that location has come up. It's turned up as a little blue marker over here. Just zoom in so you can see what it looks like. Um, and what I'll do now is simply use the add to project command and then add that to my project. Now, because I don't really want that to appear just as a, a marker on a page like that, I'm going to actually just edit its name. and add it to my project and hit save. So now let's see what our project looks like. So oops, let me just go back to normal size. Apologies, while that's reloading. I'll just let that reload. And while that's reloading, I'm just gonna quickly show you uh, again in a little spot that I've created earlier where you can simply add that to your project. Just give it its name, hit save. And you can see now that's been added to my project right here. So what does this look like now? Well, let's have a click through it. So in present mode, you can see down here, there's a table of contents down at the bottom. And if I click through it, this will go through different stages of the tour that I've identified. This is the start. Here goes a, a major intersection that was a stage, that was a, a turn in that stage. And as you can see, I'm able to sort of click through all of these cool locations, which I've been able to find. Here's the memorial to cyclist Tom Simpson. And now finally, that first pass. And all the way through to the finish line. Now, if you're wondering how uh, I might have added that little finish line, for instance, let me just quickly grab those details and I will just redo that one for you. So you can see here, if um, I just quickly grab this, I'm gonna grab a few details so I can just re-enter them. So this is how you might edit a piece. Text. So if I just oops. so if we go back to uh, this, so let's just say I do a search for a location. Like so. So here's the town, and let's just say I want to zero right in on a location on the street. So what you would do is simply click and drag your pegman down to a spot there. You can orient yourself to where you want to look. And then simply click on this icon down the bottom here, which says capture this view. And you can simply just add your text, make sure you're adding it to your right project. And there you are. So now I'll just remove the one I created earlier. If I hit present, I might just click along to the last one. And finally, we travel to our finish line.
pretty easy and pretty cool. And another great little tool that I can show you with this is that if you click on these three dots up here, you can see that you have the capacity to export this as a KML file. Now I'm gonna do that and I'll show you what I'll do with that a little later on. Hopefully that's given you uh, a bit of an idea of what you can do uh, with something like the uh, Earth Studio. It can be really, really handy. Anyway, now I, I apologize, that was Google Earth. Now we're going to look at Google Earth Studio and look, let me just make sure that I've got the URL up on screen there for you. So now Google Earth Studio is Google Earth's animation tool. Now we're all painfully aware of the restrictions imposed on non-rights holders trying to report on the games. So Earth Studio can be an excellent way to give some idea of the geography of the games. Let me show you what I mean. Um, Earth Studio is a high-end tool for creating broadcast quality video using Google Earth's catalog of 3D Earth imagery. Uh, and as you can see, you can create some amazing animations with it. The Earth Studio has some of the best 3D imagery that can be found of uh, games venues. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, break out to a live example. But what you're looking at there is an animation of the Tokyo Stadium. Now, let's uh, quickly jump to uh, a couple of examples that I've created earlier. Uh, when you first go to Earth Studio, it's really important. I just want to show you that you uh, usually will get your choice of uh, a project that you, you can re reopen a project you've already created. Uh, or in fact, you can just choose one of these quick starts. Now, I'm gonna choose a really simple quick start uh, and I'm going to choose a spiral. And we're going to basically create a really quick spiral for the Tokyo Olympic Stadium. So we do a search for it. And as you can see, it's centered it in our orbit. What you do next is just simply hit that green arrow and now you get an opportunity to do some modification to how your spiral is going. The screen on the left gives you a graphic illustration of camera view, radius, angle, and altitude. And the screen on the right shows you your live demonstration. So you can certainly modify uh, things like where the altitude at which you start that which you end at. So for instance, I might bring this up a little bit. And then it's a case of simply having a look at your finished animation. You might want to slow down, for instance, the speed of the orbit. And here you can make some fine tune adjustments to things like camera position, camera target, uh, camera rotation, pan and tilt. You can also, in the next screen, use the overlays tab, pardon me, in this screen, to import KML. I'm gonna show you what that does in a minute. Because for instance, what this allows you to do is add custom uh, spots onto your animation. But the next step is simply to hit render, preview your piece, and then you can render it in the cloud and usually have it sent to you as an MP4 cloud link. It's pretty easy to use. But look, let me just show you a couple of projects I was playing around with earlier on. First one is this. Now this is uh, an example of a simple orbit of the Mizuni Pass, which is a pass uh, that will be featured in the, uh, the road cycling race. So it's a simple enough uh, piece. Just a question now of modifying things like the pan, which I can do simply by either rendering it back to zero to change the view, perhaps zooming out, uh, changing latitude, longitude, in this case, I might boost the altitude a bit.
and and then finally render to show a pretty cool view of the uh, big pass in the road cycling race in the Olympics this year. One more animation, and this one's kind of an interesting one. Now, I created a point to point here of the road, the route of the road cycling race starting in Tokyo and ending up in the foothills of Mount Fuji. So if I hit the render button here, you can see again, very simple. Now I'm gonna actually show you very quickly how you can actually create something like this. So with the point to point animation, we'll just quickly load studio. Again, I'm just going to grab a quick start here. And start with point to point. Very easy to do. So uh, let's see, the first place we're going to start at is a spot whose name I can almost not say. And here again, you, you have the capacity to use the pan orbit and tilt a little later on to modify it. I'm now just going to add Mount Fuji as a destination. And again, here you can see you get a short preview of the trip. And the screen again, where you can modify all sorts of elements of the trip there. And then finally, just simply travel to your render screen and hit submit. Really simple stuff and very easy to use. Now, I want to show you one more cool little feature that uh, Earth allows you. I'm just going to use a different example altogether. Uh, you might remember that cycling example I showed you a little earlier on of Monvon 2. Well, let's just say, for instance, I want to create an orbit of Monvon 2. It's easy enough. We simply just select the mountain, bring it down to where we want. And let's pull that altitude out back a bit and the radius for sure. So we get a nice view of that mountain. I'm just going to pull back out a little bit more. Now, here's a cool trick. When you go to your next screen, go up to this overlays tab up here and you can import a KML file which you've created earlier. So, for instance, in this case, I'm just going to import that features piece on Monvon 2. So I'm just going to grab my file, which now has all of the various bits and pieces that I'd created, and it's now a series of overlays on my file. So now I'm just going to pull the, that... Uh, I think we should be okay. So let's just, now if we go to the render screen, you can see here that it has actually imported the areas of the animation that I created. And if I zoom in a little bit, you can see that they come up. Again, really useful way for you to create a custom animation of say something like the finish line or a pretty cool studio or something. Uh, sorry, a pretty cool stadium or something like that that you might want to do. So, well, well worth looking at Earth Studio. Now, I'm going to press on because we have a couple of more things that I want to show you with uh, uh, animation. Uh, and in particular, 
Uh, we're going to have a look at Flourish now. Very quick look, actually. Uh, but before we do that, I still have to show you a little trick you can try with Pinpoint. Now, this is kind of a useful one that could be really good for uh, if you are covering uh, the, the Olympics as a, a news event of any kind. Uh, here's something you can do. I started off with a search uh, of the National Archives looking for Australian Olympics content just to see if I could build up a little database. Next up, uh, I put all of that into Pinpoint, um, which I was then able to use, uh, for instance, to create my own little database of uh, live uh, Olympic content should I need it. Uh, it's worth, well worth giving that a try. Next up, uh, Flourish. Uh, we're going to have a look at a couple of little animations that you can do. Flourish has actually created a few uh, specific big games and big sports events uh, animations, and I just want to show them to you. Uh, here's a couple. This is a pretty interesting one. These are indig these are a series of athletes cards that I uh, created using Flourish's athletes cards tool. This is a pretty nice one for uh, a bunch of Indigenous athletes. And look, I've got to actually credit SBS's NITV. Uh, they did a fantastic story on the 16, that is a record number, by the way, 16 Indigenous athletes who are representing Australia. Now, uh, I'm going to just jump to that uh, piece, which is uh, a work in progress here, but I'm going to show you how to complete it. So first things first, you can see here is my carousel, and I'm missing somebody over here. So what I'm going to do is just go to the data field. Now, here's the uh, spot that I need to change. So for instance, uh, I want to add details about shooter Thomas Grace. So I'm just going to add his name there. And I'm going to grab a photo just by the URL from SBS's website or NITV's website, and a little bit of copy, which I've hacked from the same site. And finally, let's just write down his event. So now I can simply hit a preview. And as you can see there, it's come up quite nicely. So let's publish it. And as you can see, it's turned up very nicely. Oops, looks like I needed to republish that, sorry. Let's just do that. And there he is. Could have been oriented in shooting inwards, but doesn't matter. All pretty cool. And again, uh, in this case, you can embed that content on your website, or you could uh, share it on Twitter or on Facebook. This is what it looks like there. And all really easy to produce. And uh, again, as I say, I should credit SBS's NITV for this fantastic piece of content which I've used for this uh, little piece. Now, uh, let's show you Another one, uh, this one, pretty straightforward, is a Matilda's starting 11 team sheet. Very similar situation here. Uh, to edit this, you simply just pick your, uh, in this case, I picked the Flourish team lineup template. And you can see that all I've done is just overwrite the various positions and add images which I've grabbed from the web. Obviously, that means you can use your own uh, custom images that you have, for instance. But if, we, if I show you what it looks like when it's published, you can see they're a very nice team lineup, all ready to use. Cool. So uh, there are others. Uh, jump into Flourish right now, actually, and uh, I will remind you that for newsrooms, you can, in fact, access many and a full set of tools. Uh, 
pretty much for free. And in fact, I'm just going to double check those. Yeah, the Google News Initiative covers the uh, cost of a full enterprise account for Flourish uh, for newsrooms, who's, for anybody that does choose to sign up at the URL that I've popped uh, down below. And as I say, once you're in there, you can certainly create animations just like this one. Uh, and uh, they're a pretty cool way of engaging your subscribers and users. So we're going to uh, just move on quickly, very quickly. I'm just going to show you that uh, it is possible to, uh, if you go to Google's uh, stories.google, I'm sorry, uh, you can start using to uh, the various uh, stories.google story tools. Let me just get that mouthful out and also get that URL out. Um, look, the, the story format's a popular uh, way of publishing content on, that started on things like Snapchat. Um, they can contain a video, a short quote, an image, really good way of engaging with people on mobile. Might be a great way for you to sort of cross-promote content that you've actually got on your website. Uh, look, there are lots and lots of different ways to make them, and Google provides you with a, quite a few tools to do them. Uh, here's a, a little example I did created with the uh, in newsroom.ai app. Uh, really simple to produce content using it and absolutely free uh, for you to use. So, look, we have reached the end of today's session. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, don't forget, if you want to keep up to date with the latest tools and workflows, do head along to g.co slash news training. You'll find all sorts of interesting stuff over there. Uh, and certainly if you have any queries, do get in touch with us at the Google News Lab. Uh, we're certainly very keen to hear from you. And uh, if you have, uh, if you need to request training for your newsroom, which uh, we definitely encourage you to do. But for now, my name is Miguel de Souza, and thank you very, very much for joining me.